the basis for fire prevention. This course is, uh, this chapter rather, a little bit of a history lesson. We're going to talk about fire prevention in the United States, fire in general, like where it came from, not necessarily fire science, but talk about the fire problem in the, U in the U.S. and give some reasons for its existence. And we do have a fire problem contrary to some people's beliefs. Uh, look at the fire record in the U.S. with records of other countries. Talk about organizations that have been instrumental in the change in the fire prevention policies and how, how they've helped. And discuss the effects of timing on the at, ad, adoption and enforcement of fire prevention regulations. So as we get started here, we're actually going to have a little case study discussion about Malden Mills in Methwin, Massachusetts. Uh, Malden Mills was a textile manufacturer, had been in Meth. I can't pronounce correctly, Methwin, I'm calling, I think a little off and I'm not from Massachusetts, but it had been in Massachusetts since 1906, making wool and wool light until about the 60s. They moved to making faux fur products that were popular in the 60s, into the 70s and the 80s. They started making some other types of synthetic materials. In the late 80s into the 90s, they started to make this synthetic fleece material marketed under the brand name Polar Tech. And Polar Tech was commonly used in stuff like uh, by Cabela's and North Face. It was really, really good fleece material for jackets. The military was one of their biggest contracts and, and buyers of this material. On December 11th, 1995, there was a report of a boiler explosion that occurred in the factory. And it turned out that this factory um, was a huge complex, multiple huge complex factory buildings and textile manufacturing, and three of them burned completely to the ground. Uh, we're going to watch a couple of news clips from that time frame so you guys can get an idea of, of how it might have affected the community. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it, and then um, we'll kind of have an open discussion about what your thoughts are. I have a couple of questions to talk about. Um, and just, just so you know, this place was like, like, a, like Raytheon and the U of A and DM all combined. To that community, that was the employer of that community. And it had been there almost 100 years at this point. So this fire was pretty devastating. And my video is actually going to work. And so I apologize for the video quality. This is news footage on tape from 1995, so it's a little jumpy. But can you hear it OK? Governor Well declared a state of emergency in Bethune and Lawrence 
That means that he could call in the National Guard if that is necessary. That has not been necessary so far. It will also expedite getting some funds to this company and help them to relocate in this area if that's what they want to do, and apparently that's the word. We know that 1,400 jobs have been lost, at least temporarily. Of course, the other people are working in this complex. I'll take you on a tour of the complex, that part of the complex which was undamaged, and I'll do that later in this program. 24 people were injured. Of uh, those, uh, eight remain in very serious condition. They were working near that area where the explosion took place between 8 and 8.30 last night. And we understand there's some uh, very, very uh, bad injuries, and many of them are clinging to life tonight. We'll update that situation in just a few moments. I can uh, speak from experience, not only for the crews here from BZ, but also people that have been in this area most of the day. And acrid smoke continues to fall over us. It's been unpleasant around this area for people having to work, but certainly they will be doing air quality testing here for some time. For now, Ted Wayman, Jack, back to you. All right, Ted, thank you very much. And their determination. At this emotional that guy's the owner of the mill. Many remain in shock, worried about their future, their families, their community, during a season that should be filled with joy and promise. Casey Coffin, WBZ News 4. It is such a tremendous economic impact in the Merrimack Valley. Absolutely, John, and the promises have been made. Okay, John, thank you. When the call went out for food for the volunteers and the firefighters here, it was filled in minutes. All of the food that you see here in this kitchen was donated free of charge by area restaurants and supermarkets. <laughs> From Methuen, Charles Austin, WBZ News 4. Let's take you to Brigham and Women's Hospital. That's where Lawrence Scott is standing by. Lauren? Well, Jack, four of the most critically injured men are here at the Brigham. There's three more at Massachusetts General Hospital, and a couple were taken to UMass in Worcester. All of these hospitals have excellent burn centers, so they are in the best hands they can possibly be in. And the encouraging news is that doctors I spoke with today at all the hospitals expect these injured workers to survive. So nobody died. Um, the fire was originally reported as a boiler explosion, but what it actually was, it was a stuck PowerPoint slide. There you go. So it was actually uh, in the manufacturing process, it created a lot of this fleece dust, and there was actually a static electricity <coughs> spark that ignited the dust that caused an explosion, and then the fire spread through the factory rapidly. Interesting thing is that prior to this fire, the big one that burned the, the building down, buildings down, there had been a number of other fires that had occurred or explosions in smaller scale, but the workers there weren't aware of the gravity of the situation, the potential for the fire to grow or what could happen. So they, they kind of knew that something was a, was a problem, but they, it was never addressed. All in all, there was 37 workers that were injured. Nobody died, like I said. It was the 17th largest loss of fi uh, by fire in the United States. It's $752 million, and that's adjusted to today's dollars, not 1995. Just a couple of pictures here to kind of get the idea of what type of fire we're talking about. And this, I mean, this was a, a really big deal for those people in that entire region. I imagine it completely taxed all of the resources in the area to put this fire out. So the factory burns down and everybody thinks they're out of a job, but this guy, Aaron Fuerstein, he's the owner of the factory. He does something that nobody has done or nobody is doing at the time. So in 1995, think this is the time the United States is downsizing big industry or exporting stuff to other countries, to Mexico, to India, to other places, especially textile manufacturing, to increase their profit margins. So this guy turns around and says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the right thing. And he pays all of his employees for many months afterwards and vows to rebuild the factory and hire everybody back. And it was something that had never been done before. He was famous for it. There's a lot of discussion about him and his business practices specifically, but we won't go into that. It took him two years, almost two years, to rebuild the entire factory, which was a pretty long time. When the factory was rebuilt, he hired back nearly all 2,700 of the employees. Unfortunately, his competitors gained an edge in the market, 
and he wasn't doing so well when he came back into business. So then in 2001, they had to file for bankruptcy. They continued along again for a while, and in 2007, they were filing for bankruptcy again, and they were bought out by another company called Polar Tech Industries, doing just that, what they were making, and they moved the factory out of the region, and, it, and there was issues with pension buyouts and a lot of stuff there, but it, it ended the business. This fire in 95, it took several years for it to happen, but it ended up ending their business. So with that information, I want a little open discussion here, your input on some things. How could this fire have affected fire prevention programs in Massachusetts and across the nation? What do you think it did to it? It opened the eyes to the danger of the fleece products and that type of thing. The fleece for sure, and then even maybe dust as well, sure. right? Anything else? Do you think, looking at that fire, do you think they had sprinklers in that building? Okay. I would, I would say probably not. I was it was an old building, so most likely they updated the new building was much safer. Than I was going to say, you mentioned that the building was built in the early 1900s, and the East Coast is notorious, especially in Massachusetts, for having unreinforced masonry, all those kind of issues pertaining to fire prevention. Uh, I think this being more recent, it makes it seem not just So the construction, the, the durability of the building, or even, you know, if you imagine textile manufacturing of the 1900s moved into 1995, where these open floor plan constructed buildings with unreinforced masonry and heavy timber, so high fuel load, no fire breaks, no sprinkler system. So I don't know for sure what changes they made, but I imagine this made some pretty significant changes in policy to, to look at those manufacturing factories, textile, dust, sprinklers, construction, and, and change the code, both in Massachusetts and probably across the nation. What actions could have been taken to prevent the 95 explosion? Knowing that they knew it was a risk, they'd had something happen there before, what could they have done? They needed to notify somebody uh, of the problem instead of just keeping it to themselves. Just notification, look for outside resources. Mm -hmm. Might have that as well. mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? And do you think the fire department had any responsibility to educate the plant on the risks of static electricity and dust fires? You think that's the responsibility of, like, Tucson Fire has a manuf textile manufacturing here? Should we be going over there and telling them, hey, you got a, you got a dust issue, you could have a fire? Is that our fault? Is it our business? Their business? If it's not your responsibility, it certainly should have been whoever is responsible for OSHA compliance because there is a standard on combustible dust. So somebody should have been doing inspections and identifying those potential hazards and the exposure and identifying, you know, letting them know. And I, and I agree. And I don't know what the code was in 95 regarding that. So maybe that wasn't there. But if there was a code, and the fire department does have a responsibility to go in there and, and inspect the building. And I think not only part of the inspection is also the education piece too. You teach the people what the danger is while you're inspecting their building and making them compliant with the code and hope that they take that education to move forward and use it and apply it in other places where they start to identify risks. Or if they, they, you know, they knew that dust was a problem, they see a small fire with, a, with an explosion or a false, false, small fire with static and dust, they call the fire department back and say, hey, how can we fix this? So during this course, there'll be a number of case studies, different fires and different scenarios we'll talk about. Different instructors will bring different pieces to that, but all right. So let's talk about hostile fires, fire prevention, the government, some history. Um, we have this issue in the United States and just in general, I think, human culture that when there's a fire, we react to it rather than be proactive and prevent it. 
So we have this history of this reaction followed by inaction. Um, it's kind of built by a number of things that occur. Most people sit around and think, well, fire's not going to happen to me. I mean, you all, you all probably think that in your home. You think, oh, I'm never going to have a fire in my house. I mean, we all do it. We don't put batteries in our smoke detectors when they go bad, or we do silly things like store oily rags. We say, ah, it's not a big deal. But it does. It does happen to people. And, and the government doesn't necessarily respond to it. The government doesn't have the, for, the foresight to say, um, we're going to invest our money in fire prevention activities, and we're going to put all this money there. We don't have, I mean, we're in a political process right now. We're in election year. And none of our candidates are standing up in any office and saying, you know what, fire prevention is the number one topic that we need to deal with right now, and that's where I'm going to devote my time and effort. No one is doing that. And it's that political process that makes it challenging. You can't, you can't go up and say, this is what I want to do, this is how I want to do it, I want to spend money, because the voters say, well, that's, we don't have a problem. Why do we have a problem? Why would we spend the money there? And so the political process isn't really the pathway to solve our fire problems. And they, the political process is truly the reaction followed by inaction. The insurance industry, on the other hand, they're dealing with money, they're dealing with people's interests, they're dealing not necessarily with people's lives, they are in some regards because they put a dollar value on that, but they're, they have a client and they need to protect their client. So they have been very successful in changing the policy and they're actually the drivers, and we'll talk about that some more, who have formed fire prevention, fire code, and the way that we operate now in regards to fire, fire code enforcement and prevention. So the American fire problem, we historically in the United States are one of the worst countries in the world in regards to fire and fire loss. We, uh, American fire departments run on average about two million fire calls every year. There are thousands of deaths every year from fire. There are tens of thousands of injuries every year from fire. And fire loss in, the, in property is in the billions of dollars every single year. Um, we've known this for a while and we measure loss and specifically you talk about death, injury, and property loss, those are what we can talk about as direct property loss. You've actually physically lost something, but there's other property loss that, or not property loss, there's other loss that can occur with a fire called indirect loss. And does anybody have any idea what indirect loss could be? Any ideas? Stuff that's not tangible? Business. Loss of business, sure. Productivity, wow. So psychological stuff too, right? Anybody else? So it wasn't just the business he was losing being, by not being able to make money in that, those days or years afterwards, but he overall, overall lost the competitive edge and went out of business. That's a huge loss. And we don't measure that. U.S. Fire Administration doesn't measure, measure indirect losses. Something else that people don't think about is pets. We don't look at pets as a direct loss. They look at it as an indirect loss because pets and humans are not valued the same way depending on who you are. But, so the government knew this. They, knew, they know that we have a problem, and in 1971, Richard Nixon actually stood up and said, we're going to do something about it. So he appoints 24 people to the National Commission on Fire Protection, and these people end up ultimately creating what we know now as the United States Fire Administration. But they did a bunch of thinking, and they got together and did some research, and in 1974, they, or 1973, they released the America Burning um, Paper. So they released this paper. And the conclusion of the paper was essentially that we are one of the most advanced nations in the world, technologically, in the Western world, but we lead the world in per capita deaths by fire. And so in 1974, they got together and they made a commitment that they were going to try and cut fire deaths by half within a generation. So 40 years was their goal. So nearly 40 years passed and the group gets back together and in May of 2000, they release the America at Risk Report, which was a revisit of what they had originally done. And they concluded that we did a good job, we actually met our goal, we, we exceeded our goal, however, we still are leading the world, and it's not because we don't have 
the knowledge. It's not because we don't have the equipment. It's not because we don't have the strategies and tactics to fight fire and extinguish fire. It is because we do not invest money into fire prevention activities. And that was what they concluded in that report. So <clears throat> that was released and really we've continued to decline in fires. And so over the 10 year trend, we've, we're still doing good. So annual deaths, 1974 was estimated at 12,000. There's some reports that came out saying the number might have been a little bit higher than that, but it's pretty close. 2002, right after the report, lowest ever, 3,380. So over that 10 year trend, we've gone down, fires per million have gone down 27.7% between 2004 and 2014. Deaths per million down 28.9% and injuries per million down 39.6%. So almost a 30% reduction across the board there, which is pretty good. However, we still are double most European countries in regards to our fire loss, fire deaths. And we're still 25% more than other westernized nations that are not of the highest, highest level. So we're still one of the worst in the nation. And to add to that, the government and the media don't really recognize that it's truly a problem. So for example, if you were to take all of the natural disasters and you were to add them all together, all the dollar loss and all the deaths annually, add them all together, fire loss is still more than all of that. And what do you see in the news? You see Hurricane Katrina and, and you know Tropical Storm Sandy and earthquake here and they're dramatic and they're damaging, but the day-to-day -day house fires and people dying in, in their homes and people getting injured and losing their property and becoming homeless is the bigger problem, but the media doesn't cover that. So people don't really recognize that. So it kind of feeds back into that political process. The voters don't want to support the politicians to support the fire prevention activities. And so the policies don't really, nothing really happens until something really big happens. It goes back to that reaction in action. All right, so we are man and woman and we have fire. And so about 500,000 years ago, they show evidence that tribal people moving around had, uh, the, they had somehow captured fire. They don't believe that they had the ability to make the fire, but you know, if a lightning strike causes a tree to fi on fire, they were able to make a fire nest and they were able to capture fire and keep it going. And it, the methods about it came later the hostile fires being insignificant, really, there's no, there's no, uh, no towns, there's no um, monuments, there's no industry at this time. They're just tribal individuals living in, in huts or tents or caves or wherever they may be living. So if you had a fire, yes, you, you lost all your food, you lost your house, you lost all your clothing, but they weren't that big of a deal because it was just for you and your family and it didn't affect your community, just, just you. So with fire, things started to change. We started to gain the ability to cook our food. We could have light at night and do stuff, stay awake and think at night. We could melt copper and melt metals and make tools. And now, hey, I can make this for you. We start to spark industry. Society starts to grow. It really changed a lot of stuff. <clears throat> so we talk about the technological process in making fires. So they start 500,000 years ago, you capture it from a forest fire, and then slowly along the way there, man figures out that if you rub two sticks together, that boom, I get fire. So now we're even better, because now we can move even further out, trap more game, find more resources, we become more productive. And then they invent the match. So in the Roman Empire, they invented matches. Now they weren't, um, friction matches or strike anywhere matches or anything like that. They, they required some level of heat to ignite them, but it was easier than rubbing two sticks together and you could start a fire even, e even easier. Um, in the 1800s, they developed friction matches, matches or strike anywhere match, a match that could, you could rub on anything and it would catch fire and light. It was actually invented by a, a guy named Sir William Congrave and they called them Lucifers or Congraves was the name of the, of the matches or the slang term for it. And he was actually the same guy who invented the um, military rocket. And that's what, in 1812, the War of 1812, the red rockets are glaring is what inspired our national anthem. So that same guy was a smart dude and played with explosives and made matches. But then down the road, they made the safety match, which 
improved even more because there's issues with, with friction matches. You got a box of friction matches and you shake them, they catch fire. So the safety match required two surfaces to strike together to get the fire and that even improved fire safety on top of that. So we've gone a long way, we, we get fire, fire builds our society, and now we have communities and houses that live close together, and now when I catch my house on fire, it burns down your house and your house and maybe the church. And so people said, that's not good, let's find a way to keep the fires from happening. So the first record that we have of fire prevention activities was in 300 BC, and that's with the Romans themselves and they organized their slave groups together and called them the Familia Publica and their job was to basically go out at night and wander around the streets and look for fires to prevent the actual spread of the fire or the conflagration. They continued that program and moved it on in 24 BC they actually kind of came up with a different model and they had a, a municipal fire department and they were the core of vigilies and these guys would walk around looking for fires, doing the same thing, but they actually fought fire. And they also became a, um, an after the fire type of uh, fire warden or fire marshal. And they would investigate the fires for cause and origin and look at accidental or incendiary. And they actually would punish people for having a fire. So they didn't necessarily prevent the fires, but their prevention was through fear. So if you had a fire in your home, they would go and flog you or whatever they would do. I mean, depending on how big the fire was, I mean, there was a great fire in Rome that burned for days. I don't know if they killed the guy. I imagine they probably did. But so that was their first kind of ideas in fire prevention. Fast forward into England in the 9th to 11th centuries, they're the ones who start to actually think about this idea of let's prevent the fires from ever happening. You know, rather than let's wait till the fire happens and punish the people, let's find out why the fires are happening and, and let's stop them. So they came up with this idea that um, the guy's name was the Conqueror, William the Conqueror, was that his name? Yeah. yeah, so William the Conqueror comes up with this idea and says, you know what, you're gonna cover all your fires at night and extinguish them before you go to, ve go to bed. And they had this device they would use to cover their, their fires called a curve few, it's a French word I think, and that turned into curfew. And that, and that kind of evolved, but that meant you would cover your fires at night, you'd go to bed, and that's when that started. So the English are the ones who are responsible for the, the real idea of fire prevention as we see it now. They started to think even more and said, okay, where are our other risks? And they, the English in the 1500s started to regulate bakers and candle makers because they were working with fire directly every single day. And they said that they would have to have stone chimneys. You couldn't have wood. They'd have to have firewalls. They'd have to extinguish their fires. They did a lot of work at that point. However, they didn't do so great. And in 1666, the Great Fire of London occurred. And this was started by King Charles Baker. They had um, a store of kindling next to their fire. And it caught that on fire. And then it burned. And it burned for five days and nights and it was a pretty significant event. There really wasn't that much in regards to loss of life, but it was at a really bad time. So 1664 and before, average deaths in London were about 17,000 people per year. 1665 was the plague or the Black Death. They lost 68,000 people that year alone. So then the next year, 1666, they're like, okay, whew, we're getting healthy again. No one's gonna die they had the Great Fire of London. And it burned 13,200 homes, 87 churches, 20 warehouses, and 100,000 boats over that five-day period. So they burned down the city, and Parliament says, we gotta do something. We gotta, we gotta find a way, let's make our buildings safer. So it takes them two years to come up with a policy to say, okay, you have to have stone walls and stone chimneys and tile roofs and slate roofs. They come up with that. It takes them two years, and that's a good example about this political process. There have been a disaster, but it takes two years for them to actually get to a decision on how they're gonna address this. It takes another 108 years before they actually start to enforce the code. And that's that 
people after two years, they've made the laws now, but the memory has faded regarding the fire itself. I mean, there's, they've probably rebuilt and people have moved on. They thought, well, it's not going to happen again. It happened one time. It was a one-time thing. It's not going to happen again. So it takes them 108 years before they really start to put some effort into the, into the actual code that they had established. So that's London. That's England. But as we all know, we're all a colony of the British. And in 1608 was the first recorded big American fire, and that was the city of Jamestown. And it burned to the ground, practically. And they kind of had an idea. They had some prevention activities going on there because the Native Americans were not particularly happy that the white man had come and taken over their land. And so at night, the, the men would stand around the wall with muskets and buckets of water being prepared for fire attack, because that was a particularly um, fun thing for the Native Americans to do to the city of Jamestown. Well, they finally burned the place down, and it was very devastating. Most of the sick and injured and old ended up dying from exposure, and, and quite frankly, it could have absolutely made all the British move away from this continent altogether, but we didn't. And we continued on, and we built big cities like Boston. But just to highlight the problem that by before the American Revolution in 1776, 1775, that time frame there, they had nine serious fires in Boston. So the courts had ordered particular construction methods. Same thing, they keep going back to this. Brick chimneys, brick masonry constructed buildings, shutters on windows to prevent conflagrations, because that was big issues. They build these wood buildings and they wouldn't have shutters on them, they'd have wood chimneys, and the fire would start and spread into the next building and spread into the next building. You get a big enough fire, you create your own weather and wind, and it just would decimate cities. But the problem was, the community didn't want to adhere to these, and so the laws were never enforced. They passed laws. <clears throat> then we go to the Great Chicago Fire. Um, October 8th, 1871, Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicks over a candle in the barn, right? And it starts the fire that decimates Chicago. Um, it was not the largest loss in the United States. And what's interesting is that on the same night was actually the fire that was the largest loss ever, killing 12,000 people in Wisconsin. And on a little side note here, that same night, October 8th, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan all had very significant brush fires, um, town fires, city fires all burned. Chicago is just the famous one we always talk about. And people think it was Mrs. O'Leary's cow that kicked over the candle. People suspect that the embers from the Chicago fire flew over Lake Michigan in, into Michigan, and that's what started the Michigan fires. But that doesn't explain the Wisconsin business. And there's people who have done a post review looking at these fires and they believe it might have actually been the Persid meteor shower that was there at that time and a, and a group of meteorites or a large meteorite crashed into the earth and actually ignited all those fires. Just something to think about. But the official cause is Mrs. O'Leary's cow in the barn. So anyway, so the Great Chicago Fire, it burns 17,500 buildings, 300 people die, and the worst part is 100,000 people afterwards are homeless. Their homes are gone, there's no place for them to live. And this all is right about at the same time as a political election for a mayor. So this guy comes up and he says, I'm gonna be the fireproof mayor, I'm gonna fireproof Chicago, I'm gonna, it's never gonna happen again. And he gets elected because that's the reaction. We're gonna get the guy, we're gonna come in, he gets into the office, he does nothing. He actually doesn't, he, he underfunds the fire department, he doesn't do anything with the building code, he doesn't help out, and in fact, three years later, the National Board of Fire Underwriters gets notified that the conditions in Chicago are worse than they were before the fire actually started. So the government didn't do anything. The governmental process was ineffective. Well, the National Board of Fire Underwriters is the insurance industry. So they turn around to the city of Chicago and they say, Chicago, we're gonna give you two months and if you don't get the job done, you can't fix your city, we're not gonna insure any of your buildings. And if your place burns down, you're out of luck. And so Chicago drug their feet and a week before their deadline, they actually complied, changed their policies, made their laws and actually moved forward with the programs. So that's a pretty good example of how insurance companies are a little better driver than the government is itself. So this um, National Board of Fire Underwriters, 
they actually were proactive in some of their work as well. That was, that was also reactive on their part in some regards, but they produced this Safeguarding the Home Against Fire. It was a 91 page pamphlet that they handed out for free to two million school children in 1918. And it talked about the comparison of fire waste to other nations, and that's what we're talking about. We call it fire loss now, they call it fire waste, talking about property and people and, and, and money. And in their document, they said that the United States fire waste was four times that of other European nations. So we've gotten better, but we, we were bad then and we're still bad now. So the United States has had different ways of preventing fires. Um, generally, they're undertaken by the state and local governments after a disaster, and they're not usually proactive. Um, and that's how it had been for a long time, and it, and it started to change later. But some examples were prohibiting storage of flammable materials, um, limiting occup hazardous occupations, regulating combustible construction, but they never really got into like inspections in a formal code for a while. The New Amsterdam Colony, which is New York now, they started this program called the Rattle Watch. They actually funded it by creating a tax on, on chimneys. So if you had a chimney, you were a risk for a fire, so they taxed you. And then they took that money and they went and bought a whole bunch of brand new leather buckets, some hooks, some ladders, and then they got these guys to go around with these, these rattles. And the idea was they would sound the alarm. So they'd look and look through your windows and look over your walls and walk around the neighborhood at night. And if they saw a fire, they'd spin the rattle and they would get the fire to come put it out as fast as they could to prevent the spread of the fire. Well, it kind of worked until people realized that people looking through their windows are looking at their stuff and then things go missing. And so they kind of started to be viewed as prowlers rather than protectors. And it wasn't particularly effective and it went away. Other cities, they like in Massachusetts, Boston, and even in Philadelphia, they banned outdoor smoking, which was kind of effective, but never really enforced. And there's record that says, or there's no record that shows the law was ever repealed. And in fact, so technically you can't smoke in Massachusetts or in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, but we still do, people do. So some of these non-governmental organizations started to step up because the government was very ineffective at enforcing these policies. They'd make a policy after a disaster and then they wouldn't enforce it. And whether it was because they didn't want to ruin their chances of being re-elected or being elected, it, either way, it wasn't working. So some people, Benjamin Franklin was actually the second person to put together uh, a stock insurance company. And that's a picture of Benjamin Franklin right there. And this was the um, emblem that they used, and his, his company was called the um, Philadelphia Contributorship. And what you would do is you would pay your money into them, and they would then insure you. And there was a rate based off of the type of occupancy you had, but there wasn't so much in the regard to the inspections. Um, there's this type of thought actually started to fund fire departments because the insurance companies started to think, well, we can protect our buildings if we have a fire department who can come and put the fire out quickly and we will decrease our loss, decrease our output. So there was a number of insurance companies that popped up and a number of different individuals who were trying to protect these buildings and uh, historically there's rumors of fire departments fighting at buildings when they'd catch fire. They'd show up and two fire departments would show up and they'd want to put the fire out because they got paid on their performance. And in fact, a New York fire still calls a fire a job. We all call it a call or a run, but they call it a job, and that was because back in the day, you would, the fire would start, you'd get a job, you got paid for your job. But that kind of changed and went away, but that's just some examples of them starting to pop up. So this, that's what you call us. A, a stock insurance company is a for-profit business that you pay me to insure you, and if you have a fire, I, I pay you back. And that's the only thing I'm interested in is I want to make some money and I don't want you to have a fire, but I'm for profit. They were gaining traction and there were starting to be stock insurance companies all throughout the United States and they wanted to have a kind of uniform perspective. So they went to Congress and tried to lobby them and say, because you've got to remember at the time that state governments were really separated from the federal government. The federal government wasn't particularly large. So 
they wanted to be able to sell the same stock insurance policy across state lines. And so the Supreme, they went to the Congress, they talked to Congress, they ended up going to the Supreme Court and they ruled that insurance was not interstate commerce. So this kind of stifled their efforts some and made them have to deal individually in each state, each region, their policies and their abilities to pay for or, or sell their insurance. Um, so they put together this National Board of Fire Underwriters and this was part of their effort to try and um, standardize or make the same programs for everybody. And they wanted to maintain uniform rates and commissions. They wanted a way to repress arson. And they did that by creating a re reward program. And to this day, we still have a reward program. If uh, you give information leading to the arrest of an arsonist in the state of Arizona, the state fire marshal's office will pay you $10,000. So. Just a little tidbit of information. And they wanted, they wanted a, a, a measure to provide for common interests of the group. They wanted everyone to kind of come together and everybody to work together. But they're still for profit here. They also developed the way that we look at fire prevention today. And they started thinking about these inspections and codes and regulations, creating standards that were all the same. And that led to the development of the National Fire Protection Association. And that's what we still use today. A lot of our codes, the International Fire Code, refers back to the National Fire Protection Association's code models. You talk about sprinkler systems, it's NFPA 13. And it, the code book will talk you know, about those, but it always refers you back to NFPA 13 to talk about spacing of sprinklers, or the diameter of, of the pipes for the sprinklers, or the distance from combustibles, or the amount of pressure you have to have. So the work that they did then started the standardization, um, the type of equipment that we use, the apparatus that we drive, the hose that we use, the, all those things came from, from the National Board of Fire Underwriters and their thoughts on how fire prevention, firefighting should all work. But they had a little bit of a shortfall. They had all these good ideas, let's prevent fires, let's do these things, create these standardizations, regulations. Well. A dude by the name of Zachary Allen was a cotton mill owner and he goes to his stock insurance company and he says, you know what, I've put in all the most high tech fire protection devices that are possible and I think I should get a discount because there's reduced risk. You know, I'm not going to have a fire and even if I do, it'll be a small fire. And the stock insurance companies go, no nah, man, you're a cotton mill. You're a cotton mill, you're a cotton mill, you're a cotton mill. Doesn't matter. You're going to burn down, I'm going to pay you out what I'm going to pay you out. You pay the same as everybody else. So he got together with some other cotton mill owners and said, you know what? We should do this different. We should pay into one big pot, and it's not for our profit, it's just to protect ourselves, but let's, let's inspect our own properties, let's reduce our risks, and then let's give ourselves a discount for doing that. And we won't turn a profit, we'll keep the costs down, but it'll cost us all less, but we'll still be protected. So they started to create this idea of a fa factory mutuals. They originally limited it. Um, the rates were based off of your class of hazard. And this, this gentleman who came after him, his name was uh, Edward Artisan. He actually moved forward with this program even more. And he started to look at why the fires happened and started to investigate the fires and use science and, and um, scientific method to determine what caused and contributed for the fires to be big. And then they would change their regulations. So it really started the process we have now, which is um, investigation, um, education, and then create codes and enforce the codes. So you would, if you had a problem, you would identify it, and then you go to all of, your, all of your members in the factory mutual and make them fix the pro same problem so you wouldn't have a similar event. And this ultimately reduced fire loss and risk and money it was, a, it was a really, really good thing. So it was originally limited to textile manufacturing and it's, it's grown since then. Um, they required inspections, which people weren't doing, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger and it got more than the board of these gentlemen who had come together originally could take care of. And so they went out and they hired a group of engineers to come and continue all their inspections, take over their research, take over their science investigations, and then they, they blew up and allowed everybody to come in and that's what created Factory Mutual Global, and that's what we have today. 
So there's basically two types of fire insurance you can buy as a business. You can buy stock insurance, and as a homeowner, that's what you buy. You're buying fire insurance from a, from a private company for profit, and they're making money off of the fact that they're betting you're not going to have a fire. Or you can buy a factory mutual insurance if you're a bigger, higher risk, and they're not making money off of you. They're just protecting you, but they're going to hold you to a little bit higher of a regulation to make sure that you're lower risk, you're not going to have a fire. They're going to try to keep you from having a fire. Your insurance company doesn't come to your home and make sure you have smoke detectors and that you don't store combustibles by your water heater and they don't do that for you. So, but that's because they're for profit and they have higher rates. So this prevention of hostile fires, reduction of deaths and fire related injuries and elimination of property losses, that's just the general idea that we all have and everybody has had in fire prevention. But how we get to that goal has been different among states, among politicians, among insurance companies, among regions. But we all kind of want to do that. And that's really the idea of fire prevention. The government efforts are really stifled by what people in the community think about the fire problem. And there's, there's not enough education about really how bad the fire problem is. The politicians aren't going to go out on a limb and try and make a change in fear of losing voter support. So government doesn't do very well. Really the interest in the business community in fire prevention is what dr has driven fire prevention activities through history. And this protecting property saves lives thing, it's kind of a harsh statement because really the insurance company, they don't care about the people in the building. I mean, they care about a lawsuit that comes back if somebody were to die because somebody did something frivolous, but they only care about the business and what they're going to have to pay to put the business back in service. But that indirectly has saved lives. It has created environments where fires don't occur, where people can get out, where property can be saved, and indirectly we've decreased fire deaths in the United States because of that. And our robust economy has also kind of promoted that some too. You know, I mean, if we had a crummy economy, people would be a little different about enforcing policies or wanting to pay money. But right now we've been pretty good. And that I mean that could change. But overall, hostile fire is the enemy. That's what everybody's, everybody's mission is that hostile fire is the enemy. So in summary, reaction by inaction. That happened in the past and it continues to happen today. And I don't know if it will ever stop. And that's just the political process we live in. The insurance industry, however, continues to drive because they're based off money, they're based off of liability, they're all thinking about the interest of their, their, their common interest of their company or the companies that are part of their group. United States fire record, historically one of the worst in the Western world. It is double that of some of the highest ranked European nations and about 25% that of some of the other lesser western worlds, which I don't know specifics on which are lesser western worlds. You can use your imagination on that. Um, hostile fires has changed with the formation of civilization. Remember that in the past your house would only burn down your house and now your house could burn down your city. So that's a big, pretty big deal and it's changed the way we look at it. The English were the ones who first started the attempts at preventing fires by regulating activity. That's the real, the kind of model we have now. We, we, we regulate people's behavior to try and prevent the fire. Rather than the Romans would punish you for having a fire, and there's still some places in the world, some of the Asian nations that um, punish people for having a fire, or shame them rather. But in the United States, we try to keep you from having a fire, and that's our method of preventing. But the English started that kind of program. Stock insurance is commercial for profit. Mutual fire insurance is a not for profit group of individuals who are working together for a common interest. In the factory mutual engineers, they're doing the risk reductions. They're actually evaluating their properties to be part of that and trying to decrease their um, liability or reduce their risk to help reduce the amount of money that people would have to pay in. Fire prevention methods depend upon the political and economic climate. It really does. It's a timing piece. It really depends on what the people, how they're doing, what the what the businesses are, are people making money? I mean, you look at the city of Detroit right now, and they just filed for bankruptcy, and nobody lives in the city to pay taxes, and they're shutting down fire stations, and they're burning houses down regularly because they have squatters. I mean, I, I don't know their 
particular efforts, but I doubt they're going around knocking door to door doing fire prevention activities. Or if they are, I highly doubt they have much funding to support that program. And all that stuff takes money. But a big city like Tucson, we have a pretty good program when our economy is pretty decent. And everybody must strive to implant the concept of fire prevention as an individual's obligation to the community. That's just the last piece that we have to teach everybody how to be fire safe. And that's the only way that we're truly going to make places safe.